When creating a film, it takes a director countless decisions to get from a first idea to the final product, as everything from developing and casting characters to costumes and camera angles has to be taken into account. This makes directing one of the hardest jobs and means that there's a lot of possible ways a director can mess up. Some mistakes may only diminish the quality of the film, but others have wrecked entire franchises. Here are 10 of the worst decisions movie directors ever made. The release of the first Star Wars prequel, The Phantom Menace, was highly anticipated back in the day. Taking place 30 years before the events of the original Star Wars film, it was the first of three installments that would finish the saga's core story and illustrate how Anakin Skywalker succumbed to the dark side and became Darth Vader. They'll be in range of our tractor beam in moments. Did your men deactivate the hyperdrive on the Millennium Falcon? Yes, my lord. Good. But while there was a lot of potential for this second trilogy to become just as great as the first one, it wound up being a huge disappointment. Fans had been looking forward to a destructive clone war and a deeper insight into Anakin's relationship with Obi-Wan, but were instead presented with characters like Jar Jar Binks, overused CGI, poor dialogue, and so on. Save the Maya again! What's this? A local. Let's get out of here before more droids show up. More? But the worst decision George Lucas made was when he introduced Anakin as a nine-year-old in The Phantom Menace. This meant that he became more of a minor character in the first prequel, before Lucas aged him several years for the second film, Attack of the Clones. By making Anakin considerably older and casting a new actor to play him after the first prequel, Lucas basically introduced a new character for the latter two films, depriving fans of the natural development of the character like they had enjoyed with Luke in the original trilogy. Tim Burton's Batman films are among the best superhero movies ever made. He fully understood the character and kept true to his nature, with both Batman and Batman Returns being praised for being dark, compelling character stories. Even though there are several other big screen adaptations of The Caped Crusader, the version brought to life by Michael Keaton is still many fans' favorite, and still holds a special place in the actor's heart as well. Don't kill me! Don't kill me, man! Don't kill me! Don't kill me, man! I'm not going to kill you. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. What are you? I'm Batman. Unfortunately, Warner Brothers didn't feel the same way, and when Batman Returns grossed less than its predecessor, and some criticized the material, the studio decided to go in a different direction and make Batman a more family-friendly protagonist. They hired Joel Schumacher to replace Burton as director, and Michael Keaton dropped out shortly after. He was replaced by Val Kilmer, and in 2014, Keaton revealed that he turned the third film down because it sucked. Many fans would agree with that, as the third movie lacked everything that made the first two installments in the series so intriguing. It seemed like Warner Brothers cared more about marketing the film to a younger audience than anything, while Joel Schumacher didn't appear to have a clear understanding of the character or a vision for what made Bruce Wayne so interesting, which completely derailed the series. When adapting a story and its characters for the big screen, it isn't always easy to please fans, but in some cases, filmmakers make it a lot harder than it needs to be. Like in Jean Grey's case, for instance. The comic version of Jean has a lot of outfits to choose from, so filmmakers had a lot of options, but unfortunately, they didn't deliver. There's the yellow and gold bodysuit she wears after joining the X-Men in X-Men 1, the green mini dress and yellow mask she donned a few years later, the sleek green and yellow spandex she put on as Phoenix, the red variety that marked her turn towards the dark side, the Jim Lee redesign popularized by X-Men the Animated Series, and the jacket and tights combo that Jean's time-displaced doppelganger wears. With so many choices, you'd think that the filmmakers could have easily picked one of these outfits for Jean Grey's big screen appearance. But instead, they decided to ignore all of them and came up with their own. For the first X-Men movie, director Brian Singer and his costume designers decided to have everyone, including Jean Grey, wear black leather. It didn't get much better in X-Men Apocalypse, and even though Game of Thrones star Sophie Turner looked like the teenage Jean with her red hair, the costume Singer chose for her didn't really please fans either because the bulky black body armor that Turner's Jean wore in battle reminded more of a SWAT team uniform than a superhero costume. While not everyone was happy with the director Brian Singer's costume choices for the first two X-Men movies, he still managed to show that superheroes could be brought to the big screen in a way that both critics and fans could appreciate. However, after the huge success of X2 X-Men United, Singer unfortunately decided not to return for The Last Stand and opted to direct Superman Returns instead. He was replaced with Brett Ratner, who somehow managed to derail the franchise. X-Men 3 took inspiration from two classic comic storylines, Dark Phoenix and The Mutant Cure, and seemed unsure which one to embrace and develop. Each one could have easily been turned into its own film, and especially for Phoenix, 
Fans saw it as a huge missed opportunity that it wasn't, and instead of seeing their superhero display her powerful new abilities, they had to watch Jean Grey as she did nothing much at all. To add insult to injury, X2 co-writer Mike Doherty has revealed that Singer's original concept for the third film was much more closely based on the comics and would have made a much better film. Luckily, Singer eventually returned to save the franchise with Days of Future Past. Swedish author Stieg Larsson's thriller The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo became a worldwide success, and after being adapted into a movie in Sweden in 2009, Hollywood became interested in making their own version. David Fincher was chosen to direct the movie, but despite the film becoming a critical and commercial success, there was one thing that Fincher should have done differently. There's no doubt that Fincher and screenwriter Steven Zalian do the novel narrative justice in most regards, but they unfortunately turned its main character, Lisbeth Salander, into more of a rejected schoolgirl than a survivor of a traumatic childhood. Most people would agree that Daredevil was one of the worst superhero movies, but it became even more obvious once the Netflix series was released and gave us something to compare it to. Director Mark Steven Johnson's worst decision was probably to cast Ben Affleck as Matt Murdock. The actor doesn't seem to have the qualities required to play a superhero, and seems completely indifferent to the fact that his character is supposed to be blind. Instead of being a tough superhero, Affleck comes across as whiny and emotional, and later admitted that the movie was kinda silly. Todd McCarthy at Variety had slightly stronger words when he wrote, Daredevil is a pretender in the realm of bona fide superheroes. Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy became an instant classic, and is one of the most iconic film series of this century. The films deservedly received unprecedented critical acclaim, including 11 Oscars for Return of the King, and scored huge box office totals. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going. Because they were holding on to something. Needless to say, when the Hobbit film adaptation finally broke out of development hell, and it was announced that Jackson would be directing it, fans everywhere got very excited. But this excitement was slightly dampened when Jackson revealed that he would split the single novel into three feature-length films. Originally, it was supposed to be two films, with one being based on the novel, while the other would serve as a bridge between the events of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. But Jackson thought there was enough material for three films, so he decided to go for another trilogy. While some fans loved it, Most people were pretty disappointed by the Hobbit trilogy because they felt the relatively short novel was spread too thin to fill the long run times, and included too many forced Lord of the Rings references. Jackson simply didn't seem to know when to stop. The series ended up being not only too long, but felt overindulged with CGI-heavy action sequences that had nothing on the epic battles we saw in Lord of the Rings. While most people love actress Emma Stone, director Cameron Crowe was still heavily criticized after casting her to play the female lead in his 2015 movie Aloha. The romantic comedy is based in Hawaii, and Stone was chosen to play a character of Asian and Hawaiian heritage, which left many film enthusiasts and Pacific Islanders disappointed, accusing Crowe of whitewashing. As The Guardian wrote, the director failed to recognize that Asian Pacific Islanders make up the majority of the state's population, and the controversy ultimately affected Aloha's success. Aside from Emma Stone, its star-studded cast included Bradley Cooper, Rachel McAdams, and Bill Murray, who certainly are popular and famous enough to guarantee success at the box office under normal circumstances. For years, Warner Bros. and DC relied on Batman and Superman as their superheroes, but they were hoping to change this in 2011 when they released Green Lantern. They marketed it as their version of Iron Man, but it turned out to be anything but. Instead, it became one of the most disappointing comic book adaptations in recent memory. It was mocked by critics and struggled to make it past the $100 million mark at the domestic box office. In fact, the film flopped so badly that Warner Bros. canceled any plans for a sequel. While the project initially sounded promising, poor execution ruined it and did long-lasting damage to Green Lantern's reputation. Filmmakers relied too much on CGI, including for the hero's costume, and while director Martin Campbell shines when making James Bond movies, he seemed to be completely out of his element in this case. He even admitted himself that the process of creating this effects laden film was daunting, and that they didn't really have a vision for the power ring constructs. Instead, they just created a bunch of action sequences that seemed to lack direction and focus. Perhaps one of the worst decisions ever, but certainly one of the most criticized casting decisions ever made was probably Francis Ford Coppola's decision to have his daughter Sophia play Mary Corleone in The Godfather Part 3. Critics accused him of nepotism, and rightly so. 
Sophia lacked the acting skills and the charisma to be part of such a great cast in such an epic film series. Her death scene was the sad highlight of her panned performance as Michael Corleone's teenage daughter. Some have compared the scene to a tutorial of how to not act, while others have called it the worst death scene ever in the history of movies. Be sure to comment down below and let us know if we've missed something. Hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell to never miss an upload. Thank you very much for watching.